Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, family. So good to be back with you this morning. And then uh, before we get started this morning, just welcome to all our Facebook and YouTube viewers and uh, all our online viewers. So glad you decided to join us this morning. And then a special welcome to our Paul 97.6 FM listeners. We're so glad that you decided to tune your radio station to Paul 96.7. And uh, we trust wherever you're watching from or listening from this morning that the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, the presence of God will manifest right there where you are. So come on, everybody in this room, let's just welcome everybody that's with us this morning. Amen. And then before you take your seat, come on, just welcome someone, greet a neighbor, be friendly, smile. Wees vriendelijk. Wees te gemoed komen. Glimlach, verwelkom iemand. Sê morgen. So blij jy is hier. Amen. So glad to see you, that you didn't take your caravan and leave. You're in the house of the God this morning. Amen. And, um, uh, just, uh, just a note that uh, this morning is the last uh, morning for registration for this quarter or this term of Bible school. So you can get your Bible school um, forms at the front there uh, at, the, at the welcome desk. So uh, please write up and, uh, and register for this term of Bible school. It's going to be very good. Uh, we learn practical things, uh, things that build your faith, things that build your knowledge, obviously. But ultimately, we want you to understand things about the history of the church, about church, uh, why we do the things we do, why we are what we are, and uh, you're going to learn a lot in this term. So I encourage you. I think last term we had about 52 people register. So register uh, for this term of Bible school, and I promise you, you're going to learn something. It's going to encourage you. It's going to build you, and it's going to help you in your faith. Amen. Are you ready for the word? Is jy reg vir die woord? Amen. Wayne Gretzky, the greatest ice hockey player of his time, once said when asked what he believes was the reason for his great success, he said that he skates to where the puck is going to be, not where it is or where it has been. It's a famous line that has appeared in many books and has been used by many CEOs and entrepreneurs and leaders around the world. That although this statement is true as, as it may be, is obviously not as simple as that, in that no human being can accurately predict every single time where the right place is to be to make the shot. However, we can better position ourselves in life to see better results. And so if we have to take the life of Wayne Gretzky, now if you don't know what ice hockey is, it's like hockey, but it's just on ice. Amen? So that's ice hockey. And so he was the greatest ice hockey player of his time, um, scored the most goals. I don't know if they've, if they've ever broken his records. But obviously, by reason of experience, he would have most likely been in the best position most often of the time because of this mindset. And he learned the game and he watched the movement of the game and how the puck would move and how the opposition would move. And so he had an understanding of where the puck most likely would be. And so he could discern by experience, by reason, and by working out the game that this is going to be the best position for me to be in to take the shot. And we'd be wise as human beings and as Christians to live this way, to discern where is the best place for us to be at any given moment so we can make the right decision. Would you agree? It's a great analogy for sport and for business. But how does this apply to us as Christians? And so the answer might surprise you this morning, but let's go there. John 16 verse 13, Jesus said, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth, full and complete truth. For He will not speak on His own initiative, but He will speak whatever He hears from the Father, the message regarding the Son, and He will disclose to you what is to come in the future. In the person of the Holy Spirit, you and I, as Christians, we have an unfair advantage. That's the title of my message this morning, the unfair advantage. But sadly, however, it's an advantage I believe we as Christians don't make use of often enough. We have this 
advantage in the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, that will lead us and guide us into all truth. And the Bible tells us it's truth that sets us free, sets us free from illusion, sets us free from bondage, sets us free from captivity, sets us free from limitation. And the Bible says the same Holy Spirit will tell you and I of things to come that helps us navigate our lives and positions ourselves in the best position to be used by God. Amen. We are a people that are supposed to live by the Spirit. We are a people that are supposed to be led by the Holy Spirit in truth. There's a lot of lies in the world today. There's an onslaught on the truth, and there's a debate about what is true and what is not true. But we have the Holy Spirit that leads us into all truth. Can you say amen this morning? Jesus tells us in John 16 that it's good that He goes away and that He would send us another helper, one which would lead us into all truth, but also an advisor that will tell us of future things. Consider with me for a moment what it would mean to you and your family, your career, your business, your church, your relationships, and all those you lead if you were in the right position most of the time to make the best decisions. What would that mean to you and to your family and to your business and to your career and to everything that's near and dear to you if you were constantly in the right position to make the best decision? What would that mean to you? How would your life look different today if you lived that way? Being led into all truth. Being told of future things to come. Now hear me clearly. Because the Holy Spirit is not your personal genie. Amen. He's not your fortune teller. The Holy Spirit exists and works for the per sole purpose of God's will and purpose. We've got to get that straight. Because otherwise we miss it. And we utilize the gifts of the Spirit for self-gain. To make us look important. To make us look great. The Holy Spirit exists for the sole purpose of God's will and purpose. He will lead you in the purpose and the will of God. Yes, you have a brain. Yes, you have reasoning. Yes, you have ability and rational thinking to make decisions. But ultimately, as a Christian, if you call yourself a Christian, you want to be led by the Holy Spirit. Wherever He might lead you. Because we don't see the future. God does. And the Bible tells us that God tells the Holy Spirit exactly what to say. So this then leads me to the next question. How can we ensure in life that we are in the right place with the right people and the right plan? The answer is simple. Your life has to be connected to a purpose. Your life has to be connected to a cause. Your life has to be attached to purpose. That is why the Purpose Driven Life was the second most successful Christian book ever written. Only second to the Bible. Because guess what? Human beings want to know what is their purpose. And so when the book came out, those of you who read the book, you read the first page and it says, it's not about you. Now, vrachta, this is what I actually worry. I said, 300 rand betaal for a book. But what the message was trying to convey is your life is about the purpose of God. God predestined for you to be on this planet. He purposed you to be here for His purpose. There's an assignment that God has for you, and the only way you partner with that assignment is living a life being led by the Holy Spirit. That ensures that you and I are more than most in the right position to make the right decisions or to take the shot. Amen? Does it make sense to you this morning? So I want to lay a foundation to you, with you this morning. It might seem slightly off topic, 
not relevant to the message, but it's important, it's crucial to my message if you're going to enjoy the unfair advantage that comes with walking with the Holy Spirit. In John 18, verse 37, we read, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus at his trial did not attempt to justify his ministry by explaining what it is he was doing. He simply said he was born for a cause. And for this cause he went into the world. And for this cause he was willing to die. Jesus himself, the Son of God, understood that his life had a purpose. And for this purpose he was sent into the world. And for this purpose he was willing to die and suffer on the cross. And so my question to you this morning is, do you have a cause which you are willing to give your life for? Do you have a purpose in this life for which you are willing to die? It's a question that we as Christians have to consider, considering the history of Christianity and the church. Many people died for the sake of what we enjoy today. Are you willing to die for something greater than yourself? It's a good question to consider. Will you stand for Christ knowing it would cost you your life? And we might say, yes. Yes, I would. But consider the greatest apostle, Peter, who denied Christ three times. And so we as Christians, sometimes the church preaches a very What's the word I'm looking for? Unoffensive, easy gospel message. And it's just like, come to Jesus. But Jesus requires all of your life. Amen? He requires all of you. We sometimes preach a gospel that says, just invite Jesus into your heart. No. Jesus is all-consuming. Some people live like Jesus is just their Savior, forgetting that He's Lord and Savior. And when you surrender to the Lordship of Jesus, you no longer own yourself. You belong to Him. That's why you have to live by the Spirit. Because He'll lead you in the things of Christ. But do you have a purpose that you're willing to die for? As Christians, the answer should be simple. Yes, I'm willing to die for the cause of Christ. I'm willing to lay my life down for the sake of the church. I'm willing to die for the purposes of God. That should be a clear-cut and easy answer for us as Christians, but it's not because we get caught up in the things of this world. Most of you this morning in this room would say, that you would give up your life for your children. That you would give up your life for your husband. That you are willing to die for your wife. That you are willing to die for your father or your mother. That you are willing to give up your life for a loved one. Most of us would say that. And I hope it's for you to be true that you would do that. That you're not the one that pushes your wife into danger. Amen. And it's right to believe that and want to do that. It's a noble and a just cause. And I believe the Bible calls us to lay down our lives for the sake of others. But the question is, is your life attached to a cause far greater than the things you see in this life right now? Because our purpose cannot be attached to temporal things things that are only temporary because everything comes and goes on this earth. Everything that once was new becomes old, invalid, not fit for use. Cannot just be attached to temporal things because they will only lead to temporary fulfillment. 
and then we risk building our lives on sand. Let's look what the Bible says about who we are, what God made us to be. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, it says, He has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. He has also planted eternity, a sense of divine purpose in the human heart, a mysterious longing which nothing under the sun can satisfy except God. Make peace with that. Your husband, your wife, your career, your business, your children cannot satisfy that longing but God. Amen. Amen. I weet dit nie vir jou vrou. Maar jou vrou is nie God nie. So jy kan nie van God se verantwoordelikhede gee nie. Want is te swaar om te dra. Amen. Let me continue. Yet man cannot find out, comprehend, grasp what God has done. His overall plan from the beginning to the end. I love how the Amplified Version puts this. A sense of divine purpose. As you're sitting there, there's a sense of divine purpose stirring in you. It's there. The Bible tells us it's there. God's put eternity in our heart. There's a sense of divine purpose in every human being. The problem with us as human beings in the world today is we connect that divine purpose, we connect that sense that we feel to fleshly, earthly things, thinking that they're going to fulfill that longing inside, but they cannot. It is your purpose, calling, stirring, stretching you into the things of God. But the mistake we make is we seek fulfillment in other things because we're not quite sure what is that stirring on the inside of me. Amen. I forget there's a, there's a, um, I can't remember what the term is called now. I forgot it. Um, I think it's called, um, what's the word? Um, a rival fallacy. That's what it's called. A rival fallacy. And it's a psychological term in that people believe if they get this house, get this car, or achieve this thing, that when they get to that point, then they'll be satisfied. But then they get there, and they're not satisfied. It's called a rival fallacy. Amen? Ever thought that? I once thought, if I could just get a wife, I'll be happy. And all the men said, Amen. And so, well, the Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Marriage in itself presented other challenges. Amen. Now you're completely exposed. And there's someone very intimately aware now of your challenges and your weaknesses. And so, we live with this psychological um, Pre-proposed condition of a rival fallacy. As I get no high school, as I get no car can cry, or die car can cry, as I get my kind in die school can cry. And then you get there, and it's great, but it doesn't last. A rival fallacy. Because nothing can place the eternity that's been placed in your heart. There will always be a longing for the things of heaven. Amen. There will always be a stirring of eternity in you that things on this earth cannot satisfy. They cannot. This is why we so often become frustrated with people and the things in our life that we believe are supposed to make us happy. They can give you moments of joy and moments of happiness and moments of feeling good but they're not supposed to carry the burden of the longing that God has put in us 
for him. Amen. Are you with me? Am I talking to someone this morning? Now we can have glimpses of eternity in the moments we say, I do. I remember standing at the pulpit, just to marry, about to marry this beautiful wife. It felt like heaven. Amen. It's a moment of eternity I experience. You experience moments of eternity when you, hell, when you hold your newborn baby for the first time. There's nothing that can replace that feeling. The feeling of holding a newborn baby and you realize that is yours. You made that. We experience glimpses of heaven in those moments. Or when we celebrate an achievement. Or when we are moved by a beautiful moment or moved by moments of intimacy. We can have glimpses of eternity in those moments. Please understand me, I'm not making nothing of the things we enjoy in daily life. I'm just saying we should never seek those things to satisfy them, satisfy us. We should appreciate them. And we should want them in our lives. But they can never satisfy the longing that God has placed in us. More money is not going to make you happy. Amen. More money, if used for good, it can do good. But don't live with a rival fallacy. We're all prone to it as human beings. We also experience these moments in worship, in prayer, while meditating on the Word or during a profound spiritual experience. We have these glimpses of heaven. If you were at the prayer meeting on Monday night, what you would have experienced was a glimpse of heaven because the presence of God was so tangible in the place at a prayer meeting. So we experienced heaven for a moment. This eternal longing in us will always be there as long as you live because this world is not our home. And what we sense inside is heaven's call, which draws us then into the things of God. That's why Jesus prayed on earth as it is in heaven. We want to bring heaven down to earth because there's a longing for heaven inside of us. And so this brings me back to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's purpose in our lives is to lead us in the will of God and the purpose of God. This means that when our lives are attached to the purpose of God, that everything in our lives are then submitted to God. When my family is submitted to God, my family enjoys an unfair advantage because the Holy Spirit will orchestrate things in the life of my family because my family serves God's purpose. You with me? When my business serves the purpose of God, it means my business enjoys an unfair advantage. Because the Holy Spirit will lead my business into places of favor. Because my business exists to serve God's purpose. When my life exists for the purpose of serving God, then I have the assurance that the Holy Spirit is working on my behalf. And leading me to the right people, to the right places, and with the right plan. That gives me an unfair and fair advantage over anyone who does not live like I do. We have an unfair advantage as Christians because we have the Holy Spirit. But that advantage only comes when we live for the purpose of God. What are you living for? Are you living for recognition? Are you living for more acclaim? Are you living for more power? Are you living for more possessions? What are you living for? That's a question you have to consider. Because the, simple, the answer is not that simple. All of us have motivations and reasons for doing things. What are you living for? Is a good question to ask as a Christian in the world today. If you read about the early Christians and how they were persecuted, thrown to the lions, thrown into hot oil, impaled alive 
on stakes. They refused to denounce God. They refused to denounce Christ. They refused to denounce the church. They were willing to die for the cause. What are we willing to do as Christians today for the cause of Christ? Amen. Some people can't get, even get out of bed on a cold morning to come to church. And then I have to ask myself the question, what are we raising? Are we raising Christians that can stand in the day when Christianity will be persecuted on the same level the early church was? Because that day is coming. Might not be in my day. It might be in the days of my children. I don't know when that day is coming, but the Bible tells us clearly we will face persecution again. Not the persecution that I'm not allowed to pray at work. You will face arrest and maybe even death. And so if we can't even serve the purposes of God in the church, how are we going to stand for Him in a wicked generation? You do not have that power of your own accord. You cannot generate that power by your thinking or by your personality. That is a power that comes from the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit will give you power to be a witness in spite of what they do to you. Amen. We get to experience this unfair advantage when we walk with the Holy Spirit and when we walk in the Spirit. Every day the Holy Spirit wants to lead you in paths of righteousness. He wants to guide you into places of blessing. He wants to keep you from danger. And He wants to take you to people and places of favor. And God forbid, He will lead you also into hostile places. The Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit who led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. Sometimes I look good for doing things that the Holy Spirit told me to do. Can we be honest for a moment? Sometimes we look good for the things the Holy Spirit told us to do. The only credit we can take is the obedience. wasn't my idea, but I obeyed, and I get to enjoy the, the benefit of my obedience, but God always gets the glory. Amen? I never want to stand here on this pulpit, or never stand out there as a Christian and declare my greatness. I want to stand here, and I want to stand in life and say, because I obeyed God. Because I follow the Holy Spirit and because I live by the Word, it's a light, much lighter burden to carry and it yields better results. Yes, you are clever and yes, you are intelligent and yes, you are educated and yes, maybe you are strong and you've all those things. But I've learned in life, it's better to enjoy the benefit and give God the glory. I'm not talking about false humility. We recognize achievements as people. We honor what people do. Because people obviously skill themselves and work on their gifting. But for the most part, in the life of a Christian, we say, thank you, Lord, for leading me, for guiding me, for helping me. I give you the glory. Because I'm in your purpose. I'm in your will. If only you would know the wonderful counsel of the Holy Spirit. He is a counselor, an advocate, a friend, a standby, a helper. He is a friend. Imagine with me, if you will, how your life would improve if you were able to discern the times. If you had the ability to know things about things that you can't explain, but you just know what to do, what to say, where to be. Imagine living like that, that you're always in the right place, at the right time, with the right people, and the right plan. 
Imagine that was your life. We'd have a lot less issues in life if we lived like that. My greatest fight as a pastor with people is to get them to take responsibility for their life. Because the most valuable lesson I learned as a pastor after praying to God and complaining to God is God saying to me, take responsibility for where you are. And the best way to take responsibility is to live a life in the Spirit. To say each day, Holy Spirit, lead me and guide me into all truth. Lead me into paths of righteousness. Lead me into places of blessing. Lead me into positions of favor. That's the best way to live. What would your life look like if you lived like that? That is the power of the Holy Spirit. So many Christians live on their gifting thinking it's the Holy Spirit. Very few live by the anointing. There's a difference. The level of the anointing in your life is proportionate to the amount of time you spend with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your gifts are the ability that God has given you with which to serve Him and to worship Him and which to build a life. But the anointing is the power of God, Spirit in work, at work in your life. Because the problem with our gifting is we can use it for self-gain because the world recognizes the gifting that God has placed in our lives. That's why they are gifted musicians and gifted artists and gifted speakers. Those are all gifts that God has given them to serve His purpose, but they use it to entertain the world. And so we can't glorify gifting because every person in this room is gifted. Not one person in this room is not gifted. Everyone in this room is gifted. And we live in a world where we celebrate gifting more than we do the anointing. Are you with me? The anointing serves God's purpose. The more anointed you are, the more you'll live to serve God's purpose. We place too much emphasis on people's giftings in the church and too little on the anointing. We celebrate gifted speakers, phenomenal orators, the ability to share messages in a way that wow audiences. But we don't recognize anointed teachers. Amen. As Christians, we should, able, we should be able to discern the difference and recognize that's a gifted speaker. But we should have a longing for the anointed preacher, the anointed teacher, the anointed pastor. Because gifted speakers will always give you good pump, goosebumps but they won't transform your life. Amen? It's not the gift that destroys the yoke. It's the... What destroys the yoke? The anointing. It's not the gift that destroys the yoke. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke. It's not your gift that gives you an unfair advantage. It's the anointing. The Bible says your gift will make room for you. The Bible says your gift will bring you before kings. But the anointing will heal the results for the purpose of God. We need a lot more anointed Christians in the church. Amen. Because all of us are gifted. Amen. I realized in preparing this message was a wake-up call to me. I realized I have to be a more anointed pastor. 
yes, by all means, utilize the gift that God's given you. But me as a pastor, I realized I want to be more anointed. People can honor the gift, but it's my anointing that changes lives. Amen. Am I helping someone this morning? Because what we see on social media and online with every pastor now having more followers than the church has, that in itself is a problem. If the pastor has a million followers but the church has 10,000 followers, that's a problem to me. Tells me we are celebrating the gift, not the anointing. Young people, listen to me. Not every pastor that looks cool and hip, and speaks the right things, is anointed. They are gifted. They can be anointed. But you should be very careful what you lend your ears to. Seek the anointing. Amen. Seek the anointing. And by all means, develop your gift and improve your skills. But don't think it's a substitute for the anointing. Because the anointing empowers you to get the results that God requires. And there are only two ways to increase the anointing. It's a life devoted to the study of the Word and a life devoted to prayer. It's so simple, but when I look at the attendance of the prayer meetings in our church, I can tell you it's a life that people don't value. It's a life they don't really desire. It's a life they don't really want to sacrifice for. We'll sacrifice for our careers. We'll sacrifice for more income. But will we sacrifice for the anointing? It's so simple, but very few people do it because it requires sacrifice. Pray and study of the Word. That's why not everybody in the church joins the Bible school. I believe those that actually do have a desire to grow in the Word. And of course, there are people that always can't afford it or don't have the time. But the sacrifice you're willing to make is the level of anointing you'll live in. There is a third way as well to get the anointing, which many people try to get. And the third way is not something I necessarily like to preach on because... I don't think it's the best way. But you can get the anointing by association or by influence or by pursuit. Elijah, Elisha got Elijah's anointing, his mantle, which symbolizes the anointing because he lived close to Elijah and he pursued him. Amen? So you can get a mantle. But please don't come to me to pray for you for a mantle because I'm going to ask you, how much time do you dedicate to prayer and to the study of the Word? Amen? Because we don't want to sacrifice for the mantle. We just want someone to put it on us. We all have a measure of the anointing because of the Holy Spirit in us. But we can all increase in the anointing as we live by the Word and by the Spirit. And in closing, Luke 4, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has gifted me. Sorry, what? He has anointed me. Probably the most gifted person to ever live. But Jesus said God anointed him to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the, to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus was anointed for a purpose, and everything he did was by the anointing. That's why when we read the Bible, we see how often Jesus was engaged in prayer 
personal prayer, private prayer, corporate prayer. Because he understood he did what he did by the anointing. Not because he had the tag, the Son of God. He was stripped of all heavenly privileges when he came to earth. He had to live by the anointing. If our Lord and Savior had to live by the anointing, how much more crucial is it for us as Christians to then live by the anointing? Because the danger for us is we live by our passions. We live by our feelings. We live by our emotions. We live by our situations. We live by our circumstances. And Jesus said, no, I have been anointed. And so you should live by the anointing. You should desire the Holy Spirit more than anything. You should feed on the Word more than you feed on spur. Amen. The anointing destroys the yoke. The anointing yields the results. The anointing gets things done sustainably. We're so interested in bearing fruit but we forget the next line that Jesus said, fruit that remains. The anointing yields fruit that remains. Amen? And so my call to us as a church for this quarter is to walk in the anointing, to pursue the Holy Spirit, to feed on the Word, and to make a commitment to ourselves that I will become a more anointed Christian, and then I will live in an unfair advantage. And then I will be best positioned to make the right decisions to get the best results. Amen. Develop your anointing and you will have the unfair advantage. Amen. You receive that this morning? Come and let's stand to our feet as we close off the service. Come on, every head bowed, every eye closed. No more looking around this morning. Just you and God this morning. I want to pray with people this morning. Spoke about the Holy Spirit this morning and the Holy Spirit's sole purpose in a meeting like this. Can I just ask that people remain seated and not move around right now? Please respect this moment. Ushers, please. Don't want anyone moving around right now. That's a belief. This is the most important moment of the service. Every head bow, every eye closed, no one looking around. Just you and God this morning. Just you and the Holy Spirit. God brought you here this morning to hear a message. And the Holy Spirit is here this morning to amplify that message. And the message is Jesus. That God loved the world so much that He sent His only begotten Son to die for us. So that we could have eternal life. So that we are not damned to an eternity in hell, but that we have a life, an eternal life in heaven one day. I said to you this morning, God has placed eternity in our hearts this morning. And what you're sensing this morning as you're standing, it's heaven's call. It's eternity stirring in you to say, listen, Jesus is real. Saying to you this morning, call upon the name of Jesus and you shall be saved. That's the only way by which we are saved is when we call upon the name of Jesus. There's no other way by which we are saved but by the name of Jesus. A wealthy man came to Jesus at night after he heard him preach a message and he asked him, what must I do to be born again? It was a strange concept to him, a strange philosophy. He asked Jesus, he said, how is it possible for me to go back into my mother's womb? Jesus explained to him that this is not a physical rebirth. It's a spiritual rebirth. You must be born again in the spirit. And so this morning, Jesus is saying to you, you must be born again. Do you know that you know that you know this morning that your life belongs to Christ? 
Do you know that you know that you know that you are born again? Do you know that should you die today, and God forbids, that you will open up your eyes in heaven before your Savior? Do you know that? If you can't say that with certainty, then you are not born again. Then you are not yet a Christian. God says, there's only one way to Him. And that's through His Son, Jesus. There's not many ways to God. All religions don't serve the same God. There is one God. There is one Father. There is one Son. And there is one Holy Spirit. There is one name under the Son by which we are saved. That's by the name of Jesus Christ. And so I say to you again, like Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You're not Christian by association. You're not a Christian because you grew up in a Christian home. You're not Christian because you went to Sunday school. You're not Christian because you attended church services. You are Christian because you declare Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because you confess Him with your own mouth. That's what makes you a Christian. Is your life right with God? Have you got peace with God? You know, as you're standing there, where your life is. You know where you are with God. I don't need to tell you. Your heart's telling you right now. Heart's beating in your chest. It's racing. That's the Holy Spirit stirring you. I want to pray with you this morning so you can become a child of God, so you can become a citizen of heaven. So your life can have purpose. So you can walk in the anointing. That's you. I want to pray with you in a moment. Maybe you're standing here this morning and you realize you used to live like that, but you lost it all. Your life is a mess. You're far from God. You left the church. You walked away from God. And you realize this morning, I need to come back. Well, come back this morning. The Bible tells us that the prodigal son, while living in the pigsty, away from his father, he came to his senses. And he ran back to his father's house. You can come back this morning. It will be my privilege to pray with you. This morning you can receive a brand new life, a brand new heart, a brand new future, a brand new start. But you have to choose it this morning. So all over this place you're saying, Pastor, you're speaking to me. I sense the Holy Spirit stirring in me to make this decision. And right there where you stand, you're saying, Pastor, please pray with me. I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Please pray with me. I'm coming back to my Father this morning. And right there where you stand, while every head is bowed, every eye closed, believers praying this morning. Right there where you stand, you're saying, Pastor, please include me in that prayer. And just slip up your hand high above your shoulder and say, that's me. Lift up your hand so I can see. Say, that's me. You're speaking to me. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. Lift up your hand high so I can see. Thank you, I see your hand. Come on, now's the time. Lift up your hand high so I can see. It's dark in this place. Thank you, sir, at the back, I see your hand. Come on, now's the time of salvation. The kingdom is here. Never, don't say it, I'll do another day. Can't clean yourself. Saying you'll come to Christ another day is saying like, I'm gonna take a shower before I go to shower. God does the cleaning. You just do the coming. I'm coming. Lord, I'm coming this morning. One last time, if that's you, you say, Pastor, please pray with me. Just lift up your hand high and say, that's me. Lift it up high so I can see. If you raise your hand, you can put it down. Amen. Look up at me. Many hands that went up this morning. Right now, what I want you to do is take a step of faith this morning. If you raise your hand. Maybe you wanted to, you didn't. It's not too late for you to take a step of faith. I'm going to ask you right now to take your Bible, your cell phone, your personal belongings, your handbag, whatever you brought with you this morning. Leave your seat right now and come and stand in the front here with us and we're going to pray. We're going to agree with you this morning. Come on, step out of your seat this morning. Come on, step out. Step out. Come on, leave your seat right now. Come on, turn to your friend. Turn to a neighbor. Turn to someone. Say, I'll walk with you. I'll come and stand with you. Come on. Leave your seat right now. Come on, church. Keep clapping. Turn to someone. Say, I'll walk with you. Turn to someone. Say, I'll go and stand with you. Come on. Be a Christian this morning. Go to someone. If you saw a hand go up, 
Go to them and say, I'll walk with you. I'll come and stand with you. Come on. Leave your seat. Leave your seat right now. Come, we'll wait for you. We'll wait for you. Come on, there's more people that raise their hands. Come on, step out of your seat. Don't be afraid what people are going to think, what people are going to say. The only thing that matters this morning is what God says about you. God says He loves you. God said He died for you. But you have to come. Leave your seat right now. Come on, step out of your chair. Leave your seat this morning. Come, let me pray with you this morning. Amen. Amen. Maybe those that raised their hand have been raptured. Amen. Come. This is a life of faith. If you raise your hand this morning, it's because God stirred you to. Amen. And so you have to respond to that by faith. You in the front, you've responded to Jesus, not to a man. You responded to the message of gospel. And what I'm going to do in a moment right now is to lead you in a prayer of salvation. That's you surrendering your life to Jesus, becoming a child of God. Or if you're here and you'd realize you have to come back to God, make that decision this morning. Amen. But we're going to pray with you. And so all over this place, put your hand in your heart. Raise your other hand to heaven. And repeat after me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins that I confess to you now. And I believe that you arose, that you rose again on the third day to give me life. And this morning, I receive that life. I thank you that all my sins are forgiven. I thank you that I'm washed in your blood, that I'm whiter than snow, and that from today, I am a new creation. I have a new heart. I am a child of God. I belong to you, and you belong to me. Here is my life. Use me for your glory. And Holy Spirit, I ask you to come and live inside of me, to lead me into all truth. And here is my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, and amen, and amen. Are well, you in the front? We just want to give you something, give you a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we just want to ask someone.